Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Andrea Howard. Andrea Howard is currently a visiting processing archivist at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan, where she works to process large collections. Before this, she was briefly a local history librarian in Stowe, Ohio. Andrea received her Master of Arts in History from Ohio University and her Master's of Library and Information Science from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Andrea, we welcome you and you. Uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Sarah. And um, hi, everybody. Um, as Sarah said, uh, my name is Andrea and I'm currently a visiting processing archivist um, at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan, uh, which is right outside Grand Rapids here on the western side of the state. Uh, my presentation is a case study called Trust the Reprocess, Enhancing Accessibility for the Jim Harrison Collection. I'll be discussing the ways in which I have set out to make this collection easier to use for researchers and our student workers in what was among my first big processing projects. Um, also, I'll say this presentation was originally part of a lightning round, so I apologize that um, this talk won't take as long, but you, you'll probably get part of your hour back. So this year's conference theme is accessibility. Um, the following definitions of accessible were provided as potential areas to explore within this conference. Uh, my presentation will mainly touch on the bolded definitions here. Uh, we were trying to make the Jim Harrison collection able to be more easily used and for the arrangement to be more easily understood. And we tried to make the collection more physically accessible to our student workers and staff. So first of all, who was Jim Harrison? Um, he was a poet, novelist, essayist, and screenwriter from Michigan. Probably his most famous work is his novella, Legends of the Fall, uh, which was made into a movie in the 90s with Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins. He published many novels, novella, and poetry collections and articles in the span of his career. Um, he was published frequently in places like Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated, Esquire, Playboy, The New Yorker, and Men's Journal, among others, uh, where he frequent, frequently wrote about themes like food and outdoor sports like hunting and fishing. In addition to the Legends of the Fall screenplay, uh, he also co-wrote the script for the 1999 or the 1990 film Revenge, starring Kevin Cosner, and the 1994 film Wolf, starring Jack Nicholson. Um, in his later years, he moved out west with his wife Linda, and he died in March 2016. So for collection background, in 2005, GVSU purchased Jim Harris's papers from him through the Meyer Foundation. At that time, Harrison was still actively writing and publishing. Um, he did so right up until he died in 2016. Um, so we would get occasional additions to the collection, along with even more after Harrison's death. We currently have about 160 feet of materials, including handwritten drafts and typescripts of published and unpublished works of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, um, along with events ephemera, uh, reviews of his work, um, and various interview interviews with and and articles about Jim Harrison. Uh, we also have extensive correspondence from his family, fans, uh, friends, and fellow writers, and it's our most widely used and viewed collection. When the collection originally came to Grand Valley back in 2005, there was one archivist working to process the collection. In this stage of my career, I can't imagine processing a collection like this from scratch. Uh, so I'm in awe of this archivist who managed to bring order to the collection and get it ready for use. Um, the initial process did take a couple of years, I believe. Um, and the archivist did work with Jim Harrison's longtime assistant, Joyce Bailey, to identify people in photographs and correspondence when things were a little bit unclear. Uh, once that archivist retired, her successor, my colleague and project manager, processed or set aside any additional materials that we received. We have also received items from others for the collection. Um, so a couple of Harrison's friends have sent us their correspondence from him. And actually, just last week, we received some book, book drafts from a publisher, which you can see here on my desk. Um, so we've been slowly accumulating more materials, even outside of the expected accruals from Harrison's estate. So before I began the reprocessing project, we decided that our main goal would be to increase user accessibility for the collection. 
Any processing decisions, in addition to following best practices, would make sure that collection use would become easier and more straightforward to the user. We also had a prioritized list of things we wanted to fix. So my project manager most wanted our boxes renumbered, which I'll go into here shortly, and wanted the unprocessed materials to be processed and integrated into the rest of the collection. We could afford to take our time and be deliberate during this process. Um, I'm currently a visiting archivist at GVSU, and I was originally hired to do one job, and that was to process a large city planning collection that GVSU had recently acquired. I finished that in about eight months, so that left me with a little bit more than two years still left on my contract. So this was chosen as my next big project, and since it's the main project I'm working on right now, uh, we could afford to be a little bit more comprehensive in the changes we wanted to make. But we also didn't want to go too far into the weeds and waste time that I could be spent um, processing other backlog. Um, and before I go on this letter, um, I found that I thought was really cool was a fan letter to Jim Harrison from Winona Ryder, because I guess she liked some of his early work. So I thought that was pretty cool. To make sure we were staying on track with our main goal to enhance user accessibility, I asked myself the following questions before making any changes to the collection. So will this change improve user accessibility in some way? Pretty straightforward, and the answer needed to be yes in order to proceed with that change. Um, how much of the collection would be positively impacted? So changes that would impact the entire collection would be considered a higher priority. How many users would be positively impacted? In other words, uh, you know, would the change enhance accessibility for all users of the collection, all staff, or users of a particular series? Again, we wanted to positively impact as many uh, users as possible. And how much time would the change take to implement? Would it be a, a low, medium, or high time commitment? Um, the ideal changes would increase user accessibility, uh, impact significant amounts of the collection, impact all or most users of the collection, and would have a time commitment relative to how much positive impact would be created. So I'll revisit this again towards the end of my presentation. And before reprocessing, I thought about who would be using the collection because user accountability would be, or accessibility would be at the forefront of what I would be doing, but who are the users? So English classes at GVSU have looked at Harrison's writings in the past. We also have a biographer who's come in quite a bit over the past few years, and a couple of PhD and MA students who've um, traveled in to research Harrison and his work. We have filmmakers and documentarians come in to view materials and do some occasional filming of the collection. And we also have fans drop in, maybe more than you would think, um, to just look through whatever is interesting to them. Um, this picture here is of a GVSU student named Michael who used to come into our reading room all the time just to look at this collection. It wasn't for a class or anything like that. It's just that Jim Harrison uh, was his favorite author. And when he learned that we had Harrison's papers, he decided to come in and learn more, which obviously we love to see. And he shared that it was a really special experience for him. So what access concerns were present in the collection? I'll talk about accessibility roadblocks in the arrangement of the collection, the description of some of the materials, the unprocessed additions that were not available to researchers, and problems with physical access to the collection. The first issue we had was pretty simple, and it was with box numbering. So when the collection was originally processed, the box numbers would restart with each series. So for example, we might have correspondence boxes one through four, poetry one through 12, fiction maybe one through 11, etc. And this was very confusing for researchers. They would email us or reach out and say, you know, I want to view boxes three and seven. And then we'd have to reach back out and say, you know, which series are you talking about? You'll have to be more specific. Um, so there would be additional time spent going back and forth, figuring out exactly what they wanted to view. They would usually also get confused if they requested more than one box with the same number. So if they needed a box two and a box four from one series and then another box two from another series, they wouldn't be quite sure if they were looking at the finding aid correctly. 
This numbering system was also confusing to our um, student colleagues for the same reasons, and it made finding the series they needed to pull from the shelves for research visits more difficult. Um, the students had to memorize where each series was on the shelf since they couldn't quickly use, you know, different box numbers to orient themselves. So it was a confusing process all around. Um, but once I'm finished, the collection boxes will just be labeled individually and it'll be easier for researchers requesting materials and easier for staff to find boxes that they need on the shelves. Another issue I noticed was that correspondence was spread out in multiple places throughout the collection. So for example, if you wanted to find all of the correspondence between Jim Harrison and um, actor Jack Nicholson, you would obviously need to look in the Jack Nicholson folder, which um, I've shown some of the contents of here. Um, but you could be sure that this folder had everything that you wanted to see. Um, you would also need to look through the correspondence accruals to check uh, the collection portions that were arranged by year and not by name. And you would also want to check the six boxes of correspondence accruals labeled general just to be thorough. And when I went kind of digging around through these boxes, I did find additional correspondence between Jim Harrison and Jack Nicholson, along with a lot of other significant recipients. Um, so now the correspondence editions are in general um, editions are for the most part consolidated together. Now, if you want to look at the Harrison-Nicholson correspondence, you really do only need to check in one place, and that is the Jack Nicholson folder. Another problem I noticed was that folders were not consistently numbered. So this made it difficult to keep the researchers, or for the researchers to keep the folders in proper order uh, when they were done with them. And it made it much harder for us to put stray folders back into their proper boxes. We also didn't have a great idea of what exactly we had. Um, so, for example, our finding aid tells us that we have correspondence uh, between Jim Harrison and Winona Ryder, um, but it doesn't tell us if we have one folder or three folders or eight. Um, so if a folder went missing, we really wouldn't know, probably. So once I'm done with this process, the folders will be labeled with a folder number and their box number. And each folder will be added to archive space so that we have better intellectual control over the collection. So memorabilia was probably the most fun issue to tackle because it was just boxes of unknown stuff. Um, this is how it was labeled in archive space, just memorabilia. Uh, so the current archivist didn't really know what was there. Um, and my colleague and I had to think about how to define memorabilia because technically you could probably define a lot of this collection or a lot of the materials as memorabilia. Um, but we landed on defining it in this case as collectible unique items about Jim Harrison. So what I found is that actually most of the items in these boxes did not fit what we thought of as memorabilia. The boxes were large and flat, and it seemed as though memorabilia had been defined as what fit inside these boxes. Um, so there was a lot of artwork that Harrison's daughters drew as children, and um, there was art and posters that people had uh, given to him, some other larger items, uh, some books that seemed to be from Harrison's own personal collection, uh, but it mostly was not memorabilia. So I integrated those items where I believed they should really go in the collection, typically to Harrison's personal item series or um, sometimes to correspondence. Anytime I found other items that I would define as memorabilia throughout the collection, I would move them to the memorabilia box. So uh, many of the drawings uh, of Jim Harrison were already in memorabilia, as was uh, this lovely t-shirt. Uh, the cartoon and trading cards were originally in correspondence. Um, the Legends of the Fall matches were just sitting on a shelf in the archive. And I believe the gift certificate and haiku were previously unprocessed. So this part of the collection is now less of a mystery to researchers and to us. Um, at first, I wasn't sure whether to move items from where they'd previously been placed to put them in a memorabilia spot because I didn't want to disturb what was originally done. Um, but the category as it stood, I thought didn't make a whole lot of sense. I didn't think most users would consider items like, you know, his children's artwork to be memorabilia. And I was okay moving items from where they were because any existing context was preserved. So the cartoon was previously in correspondence, for example, um, 
but I kept the letter the cartoonist sent with the cartoon when I moved it. So it's clear how and when and why um, Jim Harrison received the cartoon. And um, this cartoon is now rightfully, I believe, highlighted as a cool piece of Jim Harrison memorabilia. Um, so this doesn't fall strictly under reprocessing, but in the course of revisiting the collection, um, the most important goal was to integrate the unprocessed materials into the rest of the collection. There were about four bankers boxes of materials that were partially processed, so they had been foldered or and labeled, um, and there were things that were just not at all processed. Um, there was a lot of correspondence, um, there were some drafts of Harrison's writings, um, books that he had been sent by friends or to write blurbs for, there were video and audio tapes, um, there are all kinds of different things. So the foldered items um, were already, you know, somewhat ready to go, but they weren't yet in the finding aid, so nobody would know to ask for them yet. Um, but now all of these items are integrated into the collection and are in archive space. And we had a really nice coincidence. Um, and about a week after I'd processed some drafts of a poem and added them to the collection, we had some documentarians come in and ask to view that same poem. So that was really nice. Um, finally, actual physical accessibility to the collections was an issue. Um, the archives are located in a beautiful building um, next to the ravine area on our campus. So our study lounge for students has really nice views of nature and it's a really beloved study spot. You can kind of see here how pretty it is, especially in the springtime. It's a really nice study spot. Um, we have our own resident stray kitty who kind of adopted us and the kids love seeing him out there. Um, so it's a great spot for them, but it's not a great spot for our archives in some ways. Um, probably the biggest issue is that we have no elevator. So our rare books in our reading room are on the main floor, but our university archives and most of our special collections are in the basement. Um, when researchers come in to view our collections, we typically have to pull these items from the basement and haul them up the stairs. Since the Jim Harrison collection is our most widely used collection, we decided that it didn't make sense to continue to house it in the basement. Uh, we're currently in the process of moving the collection upstairs permanently so that it is not burdensome for students and staff to pull boxes for researchers. Um, an obvious question regarding physical accessibility to the collection is, you know, why not digitize it? Um, we do currently digitize some items on demand, uh, but maybe in the future we could think about putting more of it online. Um, it would certainly make the collection uh, more accessible and would remove travel barriers and, you know, physical barriers as well. Um, we have digitized parts of the collection in the past for some blog posts. But there are a lot of items in the collection that we don't have the copyright to, so a lot of them can't be digitized at this time. Uh, but digitizing parts of the collection is definitely something that I'm interested in. And uh, my project manager and I were thinking that um, an online exhibit for some of these items might be popular with Jim Harrison's fans. Um, so we'll see what happens. That might be something that we're able to tackle in the future. So here are the priority questions for some of the reprocessing changes I made and one that I chose not to make. Um, so for example, renumbering the boxes made them more accessible uh, by making them easier to find on the shelves for our staff and easier for users to understand on our website. Um, the entire collection was positively impacted uh, by the box renumbering, and all users, including staff, were positively impacted by this change. Renumbering boxes was a fairly low to medium time commitment. Now, I won't go through all of these, um, but I will point out that consolidating correspondence um, turned out to take much, much longer than I thought it would. Um, so given the time commitment relative to user impact, if I could do it again, I would maybe scale that back a little bit. Um, for memorabilia, I thought that was good. It didn't take um, very much time at all to do that. And I think now we might see more use out of this series since patrons will you know, actually know what's there. Um, now, something I noticed is that when the archivist who originally processed the collection um, you know, went through, she did paper clip a lot of things together and also wrote sticky notes to herself um, that she had attached to items in the collection and I think forgot to remove. Um, so removing the paper clips and sticky notes doesn't really improve user accessibility. Um, it would impact the entire collection, but the users themselves wouldn't 
probably notice much of a difference. Um, I'm not also too worried about the paper clips since they are plastic. So in this instance, I'm just following the MPLP guidelines and leaving those things alone. Um, I have been removing sticky notes if I happen to come across them in the collection, but I didn't do a systematic search through every box and every folder, um, you know, searching for them. Um, so it's a minor issue, and since it's not one that really impacts accessibility, um, I did not address it. So we're glad that we undertook this project to increase accessibility to Jim Harrison's papers, and it's reaping benefits for everybody who was involved in this collection. Um, as a new processing archivist, this has provided me with, um, I think, valuable experience. I've never worked with a collection quite this size before, um, and this is my also first time working with a literary figures collection. In the past, I've mostly worked with um, business people and um, government documents and that sort of thing. Um, so this has been a really nice change of pace. Um, let's see. I was also able to spend more time, um, you know, just processing and reprocessing the collection using MPLP, but also targeting those areas that needed a little bit more attention. And I got experience putting accessibility at the forefront of my processing and really thinking about how patrons are going to use this collection and how to make their experience more seamless. Uh, the benefits to GVSU's archive is that now the collection is fully processed and fully available uh, to researchers. It's reduced backlog. Um, and an easier experience for users will also make for an easier experience for our reference staff. Uh, they shouldn't have to spend as much time answering questions about the collection as they did uh, previously. Um, and most importantly, the project is helpful to the users of the Jim Harrison collection. Now the box numbers and folder numbers will be less confusing, um, and the memorabilia is more specifically labeled. Patrons should have an easier time understanding what's in the collection and how to request it. Now that the collection backlog has been fully processed, you know, patrons can access all of the materials that we have, and uh, the collection's more physically accessible to student workers and other staff who need to pull the collection for patron use or otherwise. So in conclusion, or is the collection perfect now? Um, no, the collection isn't perfect, and a no collection ever is, I'm sure, uh, but it's definitely more accessible now than it was. Um, you know, reprocessing can be a difficult endeavor to justify sometimes since we do have, you know, collection backlogs that haven't even been processed a first time. Um, in our case, it helped that I was here in this visiting processing role and had the time to devote to this project. Um, we accomplished this task by creating a list of things that we wanted to prioritize. We did prioritize according to user needs, and we can always revisit this in the future if we discover more issues cropping up. Um, I think reprocessing can be a viable and realistic project as long as you have a clear end goal, so in our case, enhancing user access, and some sort of priority list. Um, depending on how much time you have to, get it, to dedicate uh, to a project like this, maybe you just do like the one most important thing, um, or if you have extra help, you can go a little bit further down your list. Um, but this was a priority for us because of just how frequently this collection is being used and um, due to the accessibility problems I outlined. And it's already yielded some positive results um, for users. So it's definitely been um, a worthwhile project that I'm glad I was able to work on. Um, thank you so much for listening. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, this I thought was cool. This is a an unpublished poem that was printed um, and we got a collection of these broadsides when Jim Harrison um, uh, donated his collection to us. And then I found that same poem in one of his journals. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but yes, thank you. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I can put my email address in the chat as well. So. Thank you, Andrea. That would be great. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, we will get started with one question that is in the chat, and uh, it was, did you take physical disability into the project work? Um, yes. Yeah, so by moving the collection upstairs, we did, I think, uh, we have had problems with that in the past where it's just not accessible for everybody to um you know, to be able to pull these collections. So, you know, taking staff, um, 
into account as well has been important. And we do digitize on demand um, as well. So if someone has a reason that they can't come to the archive or if that won't be the most conducive space for them to conduct their research, um, as long as they're not looking at you know too many things, we can definitely send them some stuff as well. Great. Um, the next question is a little more housekeeping. Will you be able to make the presentation slides available for us? Um, yes, yes, I okay. should be able we'll, to do that. Um, yep. Yeah. All right, we'll work on that. Yeah. Um, and have you, or do you plan on putting the new finding aid online? Um, yes, once that finding new finding aid is complete, um, we will be putting it online. Right now, it still doesn't reflect um, like box changes, folder changes, because to be honest, I thought I would be done with that at this point. Um, but it's certainly taken me a lot more time than I thought it would. Um, but once it's done, the new finding aid will be available online. And maybe I can include a link to that um, in this as well. Great. Um, yeah, I was curious. Uh, so did you keep really good documentation of all the decisions that you made as you were making changes um, to sort of for that institutional memory. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So we, um, I have been taking notes so that when I do update archive space, I can say, you know, this is where this originally was. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at this, you may also want to look at, at this as well, you know, just kind of making those notes so that people know kind of how this was originally done and what we've done you know, what we've done to make changes. Um, yeah, we were a little, you know, I, like I said, I didn't want to move too many things around, but, um, you know, I think the notes should help at least preserve that context. Great. Um, we have another question. Uh, can you provide more details about how reorganizing the content into digital, digital and accessible grouped logic worked with the physical original order considerations? Um, this is, pretty similar uh, to the previous mm -hmm. questions, but did you create new documentation to connect the physical arrangement with the digitized versions? Yes. Um, so once we have that, um, that will be part of the finding aid that we post online. Again, just saying kind of where these things originally were and we're keeping the original finding aid as well. There haven't been too many changes. I mean, you know, it's, it's small things within the series that are changing. Um, there haven't been any huge, um, you know, moving things around in the collection. Um, but the things I have moved, I've definitely documented. Awesome. Um, have you considered adding subject and agent headings on a series, subseries, or even the item level to the archive space record in the future? Do you feel like that would be worthwhile or improve accessibility? Yes, um, I think so. We do currently have some subject headings, um, agent headings, that sort of thing, um, just at the collection level. But I am looking to add some of that to probably the series and subseries level. I doubt we'll, we would get to item level. Um, but I do think that would um, increase discoverability of some of the items in this collection. So that is um, on my list. And archive space is definitely the next big thing I have to um, work on for this collection, so. Um, you did say that uh, usability has already shown to be improved. Um, have you gotten like actual feedback from users of the collection since, since you've reprocessed it? Um, so far, let me see. We had the, the user who was able to use the the poems that were previously um, unprocessed. And um, we did have a user come in who uh, uh, appreciated that we now had this, uh, some other new materials that were labeled. And so he was able to find them online. He did just have to ask one of us, um, you know, an archivist uh, for help. He was able to kind of find his own his own things. Um, once the box numbers are in archive space, I will be here. I, I do think that will definitely help, um, but no one's pulled anything in the last like month or so. So we'll have to see. Okay. Yeah. I was curious to see if there's any plans for assessment to sort of see, see um, like the data on, on how yeah. well this has improved things for everyone. Yeah. I think the data will probably be anecdotal but we'll have to, I think, probably through our reference staff, um, asking them, you know, was the, these been smoother interactions since, you know, since we did this? Do people have a better understanding of what they're asking for? 
So hopefully that will help. I think bringing it upstairs was a, was a major improvement, right? Yeah, (laughs) definitely. Yeah. Uh, We'll give it a couple more minutes to see if any more questions come through. Um, but while, while we wait, I, I was curious, um, you did say it's a frequently used collection and that really went into your decision-making for prioritizing this collection for reprocessing. Were there any other factors considered? Um, I would say, say donor expectations, but I know that he has since passed away. Um, but any sort of push from, you know, resource allocators or any other interested parties? Um, yeah, we do have, um, our, the biographer who's been coming in is, you know, writing a biography about Jim Harrison that I think will be out in the last couple of years. Um, and he comes in, I think he came in last summer for a few weeks and he comes in periodically. Um, you know, so we know in the documentarians, I think there are a couple of different documentaries kind of in the works about Jim Harrison right now. Um, so we knew that there were people continuing to use the collection and, um, we do get more people coming in, um, occasionally and and they did ask i had um, visitors ask a question the other day that i was like oh once i have this done they'll be able to see it on the finding aid you know um but yeah it was um mainly you know taking care of the backlog and um just making sure that that these interested parties were seeing everything that was available great um so uh this would inspire uh, you or any other archivist there to uh, tackle the next one, huh? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Like you said, no collection is perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> Always scrutinizing them. Yeah. All right. Well, um, it's it's a little bit after 1130. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and uh, and com- end a little bit early today. Um, Thank you again, Andrea, for a great session. Um, We are going to uh, take a break now until one. Uh, So uh, have a have a great lunch. And uh, we will be back to finish up our um, our last set of concurrent sessions for for day one of our conference. Thank you so much. Thank you.